Just a word, please, before I preach. One of our goals in the year that is ahead is to multiply authentic worship opportunities for people in this congregation and, for that matter, people in this city. We're already doing that in a large measure. We already have worship experiences here at 6 a.m. on Sunday morning in the Lee Fellowship Hall, at 8 o'clock in the Reformation Chapel, at 9, 10, and 11, 15 here in the sanctuary. We have a midweek worship service on Wednesday. We have other worship opportunities as well. But we're getting ready to expand those opportunities, multiply them considerably. We will move toward more frequent opportunities for you to partake of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. We will be creating healing services, especially for those who have deepest need. We will be creating multilingual worship experiences here. In addition to that, we will tackle worship experiences tied to special events and days in the life of people in this land and in our church. The first of those, for example, will be on September the 11th when we will have two worship services here in this sanctuary. We also, on September the 8th, will add yet one more worship experience on Sunday morning. 1115 in the Lee Fellowship Hall. That will be an informal worship experience, the preaching done primarily by Peter McKechnie and Tim Philston. And at the same time, at 1115 here in the sanctuary, more formal worship will be held. Now that's just a hint of what is to come. And we have a lot of really very noble reasons for doing that. But I'm going to tell you the real reason. The real reason is we are determined to remove any excuse you might ever manufacture for not coming to church. Somewhere in all of that multiplicity of opportunities, there will be a service that is tailored to meet your spiritual needs, and not only that, but to fit your calendar. No more excuses. We as a people are called, our highest calling is to worship the name of our God. And that is our priority in this church. Will you please join me in prayer? Give me Jesus, Lord. Give me Jesus. You can have all the rest. Just give me Jesus. Amen. If I were to ask you to name for me the one person who wrote more of the material in the New Testament than any other single writer, my guess is that you would answer Paul or perhaps John. You would be wrong. The person who wrote more of the New Testament than any other single writer was actually Luke. You see, Luke wrote both the Gospel of Luke, but also the book that we know as the Acts of the Apostles. And when you take Luke and Acts together, they comprise more than one-fourth of all of the material in the New Testament. And when you take them together, they play an incredibly pivotal role in our understanding of the life of Jesus Christ and the founding of the church of Jesus Christ. 
Now, ironically enough, while Luke tells us much about Christ and about Christ's church, he tells us nothing about himself. All we know of Luke can be found in just ten words. Ten words lifted out of three of the letters of Paul. I would contend, however, that those ten little words give us a composite portrait of this remarkable man. Further, I would contend that those ten words give us a clear picture of how we are to live for Christ in our world today. And therefore, right now, I would like to invite you to look with me at those ten words. Words one and two. Beloved physician. Now you may remember that Paul frequently at the end of his letter liked to make references to specific individuals. And at the end of his Colossian letter, he writes, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Paul describes Luke with two words, beloved physician. Look closely. Physician. Obviously, Luke was a doctor. But also, obviously, Luke was engaged in a great mission enterprise for the Lord. Now, what does that tell you about Luke? I want you to remember, please, that then as now, a doctor's career was terribly demanding and required specialized training and skills. Then as now, a doctor would always be at the beck and call of the sick and the needy. And therefore, it would have been very easy and entirely justifiable for Luke to have said, Now look, I am way too busy tending to the needs of the sick to do anything big for the Lord. Luke never said that. Luke, you see, never drew a distinction between what he did for a living and what he did for the Lord. He never separated his sacred faith from his secular work. That's an important principle for us to learn and to remember. He never drew a distinction between what he did for a living and what he did for the Lord. How can I ever forget visiting the Presbyterian Hospital in Gwangju, Korea. There I was taken to the operating room in order to participate in what is standard surgical procedure in that great hospital. In the operating room, on the operating table, there was a woman about to have serious surgery for cancer. However, before the anesthetic was administered, all of us in the operating room, the surgeons, the anesthesiologist, the nurses, the aides, the patient, and I, all joined hands and all prayed. Only then did the operation begin. Dr. Luke would have understood that and appreciated it. Because, you see, Luke never drew a distinction between what he did for a living and what he did for the Lord. He was just as comfortable with the practice of prayer as he was with the practice of medicine. There's a note for us to take for our own living. We are never but never to separate our faith from our work. We are never to draw a distinction between what we do for a living and what we do 
for the Lord. But Paul called Luke beloved physician. He added that second word. I want you to understand something. That word beloved applied to Luke was very telling. It meant that Luke was more than just a doctor. You see, that word beloved refers not to pills, but to people. Not to techniques, but to relationships. You do not become beloved simply by wielding a scalpel and distributing medication. There is something more here. Luke obviously was one who chose to make his work an act of glorification to God and an act of blessing to people. You see, he dealt with people not only in terms of their physical needs, but also their spiritual needs. He worked with people for their good, but also for their Christ. He was more than just a doctor. And it's all captured in that lovely little word, beloved. I looked it up. That word appears in the Bible a number of times. And usually it refers to a relationship. Beloved brother, beloved sister, beloved friend. This is the only time in all of the Bible where that word is used to describe a job. Isn't that amazing? Obviously, Luke was one who worked in such a way that he could bring glory to God and blessing to other people. There is a lesson in that for our own living. See, you don't have to be just an accountant, just a salesperson, just a teacher, just a homemaker, just a business executive. You can be something more. You can be beloved. You can resolve to yourself that you are going to take and use your work, your calling, your vocation to influence other people for good and for Christ, to help shape other people's lives, to encourage other people to become what God means for them to be. That was the glory and the genius of the life of Dr. Luke. That's why Paul called him, I think, beloved physician. Now look at words three, four, and five. My fellow worker. The shortest book in the New Testament is Paul's letter to Philemon. It's just one little chapter long. And at the end of that chapter, Paul lists Luke as one of his fellow workers. Now I want us to understand that when Paul used the word worker here, he meant it quite literally. You see, Paul and the others were not just missionaries who were being supported by a church or a denomination. No, quite the contrary. They had to ply their trade every day, whatever that trade happened to be, while they were also engaged in their missionary effort in order to make ends meet. It was hard work. And so therefore, when Paul calls Luke my fellow worker, he was letting us know that Luke was not just an honorary member of Paul's missionary team. No, he was a worker with a hard job to do. Now, what is truly amazing here, when you stop to think about it, is that these words written by Paul are the only praise Luke ever received for all of his effort. Paul said, my fellow worker. That's it. 
I want you to make a note about that. You see, in our own living, we are to be, I think, people who, who are like Luke, who work for the sheer joy and pleasure of the Lord, not for any praise or gratitude or reward we might receive or might not receive along the way. Anyone who has ever visited the country of Denmark knows the work of the great sculptor Bertel Torvaldsen. Torvaldsen's works, for the most part, reside now in his native Denmark. However, most of Torvaldsen's actual work was done in Italy, where he could acquire the great blocks of marble that he required to fulfill his artistic creation. On one occasion, Torvaldsen had carved this immense, magnificent statue. And he ordered it packed up and crated for shipment back to Denmark. Now the workers who packed that immense statue in the crate used a kind of thick grassy straw that was readily available in Rome. That straw became the packing for this huge statue that would hold it in place during shipment. In Copenhagen, when the statue was uncrated, the workers there took this straw, and there was a lot of it. They took this straw and they used it for mulch wherever it was needed. What they did not know was that that straw contained tiny seeds which had been carried on the winds of Rome. And as a result, the next spring, wherever the workers had spread that mulch, Suddenly, surprisingly, but so beautifully, the flowers of Rome began to bloom along the streets of Denmark. I want to suggest to you that Luke's life was like that. He never received acclaim and attention. Paul and Peter, they got all of that. The only praise Luke ever received was, Paul called him, my fellow worker. And yet I believe that as Luke moved up and down and around the Mediterranean world, wherever he went, the flowers of the gospel of Jesus Christ began to grow and to bloom. Surprisingly, suddenly, but oh so beautifully, wherever he went. There's a lesson there for us in our living. We are called to be the servants of Christ, yes. We are called to be fellow workers with Christ who quietly, lovingly, faithfully, in every way, in every day, speak and live the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it is by so doing that the beauty of the message of our Lord is spread into the world. I actually think that's what Paul was calling us to realize when he said of Luke, he is my fellow worker. Now, words 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Only Luke is with me. Those words come at the end of 2 Timothy, 4th chapter, the 11th verse. I actually believe that they are the most touching and beautiful words of them all. 
You see, at this point in time, Paul was in prison in Rome. He was under the sentence of death. This was a tough time for Paul, a tough time for any Christian carrying the name of Jesus. All around Paul, Christians were being mauled by wild animals in the arena or they were being tied to stakes and set on fire in order to light up Roman garden parties for heaven's sake. It was a tough time for anyone carrying the name of Jesus. And Paul notes that during this tough time, those who had been with him were gone, disappeared, even deserted him. Only Luke, he says, only Luke is with me. Only Luke stayed. Only Luke was loyal to the end. Only Luke remained faithful to Christ and faithful to Paul to the uttermost. Only Luke. There is, there is something incredibly beautiful about those words, isn't there? Only Luke is with me. You know, if you stop to think about it, it's really easy, as a matter of fact, to live the Christian life when everything is good. When the tides of the faith are running at the flood. It's easy. I want to say this, and I make no apology for saying it. I want the Christian faith to be the dominant faith in the world. I want churches filled to overflowing. I want people one to faith in Jesus Christ. I want Christian beliefs to be accepted by society. But I know something. It's easy. Maybe, maybe it's even too easy to be a Christian in circumstances like that. Paul understood, oh yes. You remember earlier in his life when he was in Ephesus, it tells us that the amphitheater in Ephesus was crowded with people who came to hear him preach. The gospel message fell on eager, receptive ears. Christianity was booming in popularity. And at that point in time, Paul was surrounded by friends. That's when Mark and Demas and Aristarchus and all of the rest of them were with him. But later on, when the going got tough, when Paul was in jail, when hope seemed dim, the others were gone. Only Luke was left. Only Luke. I don't think I need to tell you this, but this is a tough time to be a Christian in this world. And this is a tough time to be a Christian even in this country. Carrying the name of Jesus now carries a rising cost. If you doubt that, then let me urge you to get and to read Franklin Graham's new book called the name. He makes the case overwhelmingly. There is one paragraph in the book that I found particularly potent. Listen, Jesus is gentle, but he is not weak. He loves the sinner, but is absolutely intolerant of sin. He is not a negotiator. He is Lord. It is this bristling truth that invites intolerance toward Christians. Jesus did not say, do your own thing, all roads lead to God. That would have made Jesus politically correct. But Jesus is not politically correct. He is Lord. He is Lord. 
He is the true Lord. He is the only Lord. He is the Lord of all other lords. He is Lord. And what Jesus the Lord wants to know from you and from me today is not will we be with Him when it's easy to live the Christian life and when we can worship God as we please. No. What Jesus the Lord wants to know from you and from me today is will we stand true and strong with Him when the going gets tough and when it costs us something to carry His name? Will we stay true, strong, loyal, faithful to Him and to Him alone even when we seem to be alone or at least when we seem to be in the minority and when it seems that hope is dim? Will we stand with Christ to the end? That is why the words of Paul cut so cleanly to my heart and speak so clearly to our living. Only Luke is with me. Just ten words. That's all we know of Luke. Those ten words do give us a composite portrait of a remarkable man who lived for Christ. Ten words. If only we would begin today to live like Luke. If only. Let us pray. God on high, hear my prayer. Enable us by the power of your Holy Spirit to live in every way and every day quietly, lovingly, faithfully, courageously, significantly for Jesus Christ. Amen.